In this video we're going to discuss flywheels and the purpose that they serve in shaft design. So let's consider a linear mass that's moving in a constant velocity and therefore we've got a force coming into it Fm and a force coming out of it Fl and if the two of them are moving at a constant velocity then acceleration is equal to zero and Fm equals Fl. Now let's say that this FL is a function of time now. So we've reached steady state and then FL begins to fluctuate a little bit. And then let's say that there's this total F which is equal to FM which is a constant minus FL which is now a function of time. If I were to look at the energy at any particular time I would say the energy is equal to mass times velocity squared over 2. And since I understand that acceleration is the derivative of velocity, and velocity is the derivative of position, I, I realize that this means that um, F, if F is varying with time, then acceleration has to be varying with time. And if that's the case, then V isn't really a constant. In other words, at this point, we're no longer operating at constant velocity. Now, here's a trick, and I recognize it's a trick, but let's, let's have a look at what this trick does. Suppose I take F is equal to MA, and I write A as dV dt, and let's just say, for some reason I know that it's a good idea to multiply by dx over dx. Well, now by rearranging my denominators, <coughs> I guess I'm rearranging my numerators, and now by rearranging my numerators, I see that I have dx dt and dv dx. Well, that's kind of nice because that means I have mv dv dx. Now if I multiply both sides of the equation by dx, I have a separated differential equation. On the left-hand side, we have an expression of work and therefore on the right hand side we have something having to do with energy. So what this is really expressing is that when the force changes, FL is changing with time, when that occurs there is work being done to the mass and energy being taken out and added to the mass as that occurs. So let's continue going a little bit, starting from f dx is equal to mv dv and integrating both sides. On the left hand side I'm going to in integrate from some point x1 to another point x2 and the corresponding velocities as the velocity changes from v1 to v2. I now can see that's exactly what I have. I have work on the left hand side and the change of, of kinetic energy on the right hand side. So let's take a look at a specific function. So look at this function. We have um, the force F, which I'm writing in newtons, and X is in meters. And you can see that F is varying with time. This is because FL changed, possibly. Well, I recognize that this Fm minus FL is proportional to the change of energy in the system. And that means I can take the average of the energy of the system and then recognizing that this is cyclic, so we're going to say that this is happening every so often, back and forth and back and forth, um, I'm going to choose to start my evaluation, and I'm going to choose that starting spot to be x is equal to zero, and I'm going to choose that um, x is equal to zero at t is equal to zero at when the force is equal to the average force. So if the force is fluctuating between some high value and some minimum value, it has to pass through the average, average value, and that's where I'm going to call time is equal to zero. Then, at any point in time, I can compare the amount of energy in the system to the initial energy. So the energy when T is equal to zero is the m over 2 times when velo the velocity when t is equal to 0 squared. That's just the energy at the initial state. And again, if I integrate this, 
I now, at any point in time x, I can find the total amount of energy in the system. And that gives me the velocity, and this is the key. This is what I was looking for, because what this shows is that this whole equation, um, that the velocity at, of my output is dependent on the mass of the system. So the larger the mass of the system, the more energy it takes to slow it down and the more energy it takes to speed it up. So it's going to tend toward an average speed easier if it's larger. And this makes sense. If you have a huge ship at sea um, coasting at a constant velocity, it's going to take a lot of energy to slow it down a little bit. So that, that's intuitively what we're doing. So velocity is dependent on the change in force, but it's also dependent on the mass of the system. And that's what we're going to key in on as we look at um, torsional systems and using um, a flywheel to help us have a constant angular velocity. So, very often in rotational equipment, changes in, vo changes in velocity cause a decrease in the life of the equipment. So we don't want that. We want nice, smooth velocities. Therefore, if the rotational system is heavier, what I mean by heavier, they have a large inertia, then they're less sensitive to variations in the loads than systems that are lighter, which means if I provide a, high, a flywheel with a large inertia, I'll cause the velocity of the shaft to remain more stable. It's going to take more energy to get it started, but once it's moving at a constant velocity, it's going to have a tendency to stay at that constant velocity easy, easier. So let's apply this now to rotational um, motion. So now I have torques instead of forces, and I have I instead of M, and I have alpha, or angular acceleration, instead of A. So my work used to be force times distance, and now it has become torque times the angle that it moves around. So everything works the same. I'm, what I'm showing in this graph is theta and torque. So you can see that there's a change in torque. And you can see that there's several locations, A, B, C, D, and then we're back to A again, and this is a repeating cycle. And so I can see that the area under the curve from 0 to A, the area is the largest value. It's 20,000. The other positive value is 15,000 between C and D. So this area right here is the maximum, the area under the curve when I make this crossing is the maximum positive area. And so that's going to correspond with the most force um, that we've taken out of the system and therefore the speed is going to be a minimum at that point. Now as I look at the total integration, here is the maximum area under the curve. And there's another negative under the curve. And this point right here corresponds to the amount of the most energy that has been removed from the system or added to the system, and therefore this is where the speed is a maximum. So let's look at these values. So here's a, B, C, and D with the area between A and B, A and B, and B and C, and C and D, and D and A again. Let's look at that in graph form. So here's the accumulated area at B. This is a 20,000. From B to C, I have minus 26,000, so I have an accumulated of minus 6,000. From C to D, I have um, a new area of 15,000, so my accumulated is 9. And then from D to A, I'm subtracting 9,000, so I'm back to 154. And so what I see here is that the very maximum accumul accumulated value is right here, and that corresponds to the minimum velocity. The minimum accum accumulated value is right here, and that corresponds to the maximum velocity. So if I can increase um, I, I can stabilize the difference between omega min and omega max. Now, one of the things that's really important about flywheels is that they're inherently unstable at high speeds. 
uh, flywheels act as if they're pressure vessels and it turns out that the maximum stress in the system occurs on the inside radius of the flywheel and it's caused by the tangential stress. This is the tangential stress of a cylinder and plugging in everything for a solid round flywheel um, we'll get that the maximum toward, um, stress caused by the tangential in the tangential direction occurs on this inside edge and it's equal to this which is a function of the density of the flywheel gravity Poisson's ratio outside radius and inside radius and speed so that means first off I can calculate when this will yield and it's going to yield at a, any given speed when um, SY, well here's my factor of safety. As this gets to SY we would yield and so we have a factor of safety that's equal to the yield strength divided by the maximum stress. I also can solve this equation for omega. So this is just rearranging the equation so that I can see what the speed is for a given maximum and now if I plug in the yield strength this gives me what the yield speed would be. That means any flywheel can operate at some speed that would cause it to yield. And by the way, it's going to yield, first off, it's going to yield uh, catastrophically, so it's going to blow apart. And it's going to blow apart from the inside, which means it has lots of fragments, so it's a very dangerous condition. You always want to check what your yield speed of your flywheel is to make sure that it's safe to operate. Here's the factor of safety in the operating system. It's omega yield divided by the speed that I plan to run it at. So that's always something to check with when you're designing your flywheel. I also want to talk a little bit about other vibration considerations. So there's three major vibrations that shafts can undergo. The one that you probably is most common thought about is just lateral vibration. So in this one, the shaft just bounces up and down. Shaft world happens because of eccentricity in the shaft. And so what you get is the shaft stays in a deformed position and rotates around that position like a jump rope. And then finally, the third one, torsional vibration, is harder to visualize, but there is some vibration that happens torsionally. Um, and, and all of these need to be considered. In this class, just to give a taste of the type of thing you might would do, we're just going to consider lateral vibration. And as we do that, we'll look at Raleigh's method. And what Raleigh's method says is that there's a lot of math behind it, but the gist of the method is I can take the weight of a mass times the deflection of that mass and sum them all up and divide it by the weight times the deflection squared and take the square root of all of that and that'll give me the natural frequency of that system. So in, in general, if we have a mass with flywheels, we can take those fly, or if we have a shaft with flywheels, we can take the flywheels as masses. We're going to make a, an approximation that the shaft is relatively massless compared to the flywheels and we're going to find the deflection at the points. Which deflection should I use? Well, Raleigh pointed out or showed that it didn't really matter which deflection I used as long as I was consistent. And so the standard is to use the deflection caused by just the masses acting on the beam and not applying any sort of external applied forces. So I'll take the mass, the weight of the forces, calculate the deflect, deflection of the shaft with those weights as concentrated forces, use those deflections to calculate the natural frequency, and then as we said earlier, we want to make sure that any sort of operating forces and torques are, are um, being applied to the system less than at least th three or four times that of the natural frequency. So the natural frequency needs to be at least three or four times um, higher than the forcing frequency of any input that we're putting into the system.